Good afternoon and welcome to our Lunch and Learn webinar series. Today's topic, Leaders at All Levels, Building High Performing Teams, is brought to you with the support of our sponsor, University of Fredericton. My name is Krista Ross, I'm the CEO of the Fredericton Chamber of Commerce and we're so pleased to have you with us today. Our presenter today is Ross Preston of Adroit Leader and Team Development. He is one of the founding directors of Adroit, which is a development company that grows leaders and teams. Ross grew up in the UK playing professional rugby at college before enjoying an 18-year career in the British Commandos that saw him deploy on operations around the world. Ross left as a Lieutenant Colonel after he was wounded on his third tour in Afghanistan, having been awarded both the MBE and a US Presidential Citation during his career. Before moving to Canada some four years ago, Ross was the Director of Operations for Shelterbox, an international disaster relief charity and he now works full-time in people and team development all over the world. But he's always pleased to return to Keswick Ridge where he lives with his wife, his three boisterous sons, and two dogs. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ross Preston. Thanks, Krista, that's, uh, that's very kind. Um, first, thanks for inviting me. Um, always, I'm very happy to be here. It's always a pleasure to be working with the, with the Chamber, and it's great to be part of a Chamber that is so vibrant and so involved in its uh, business community. And, uh, and so I'm very appreciative, actually, of the opportunity uh, to do this as well. Um, we're going to sort of start today. I thought we'd look a little bit, uh, first of all, at, um, at sort of why I'm here and, and, and who I am. Um, very kind introduction, I'll sort of add a little bit to that. Um, and then we're really going to get into high performing teams and, and leaders at all levels, which I think is something that we're starting to hear more and more of um, across the sort of people development uh, sphere. But, uh, but what does it actually mean? And again, it could be one of those, um, one of those catchphrases I think that, that we hear a lot of, but uh, is actually quite difficult to pin down what people actually mean. So again, quick introduction to me. Um, the, the sort of key point I think is that um, I'm going to talk a little bit funny. Um, I obviously uh, came from, uh, from overseas to come here. Uh, we've been here about four years now with my family and we absolutely love it in Fredericton. Um, and, and what I do is I, I work with um, individuals and teams and organizations, large and small, and I'm lucky enough to, to do that globally. And I'll sort of bring out a few points from some of the, uh, the teams I've worked with uh, previously. And I think you've kind of already heard um, a, a good synopsis of, uh, of what I've done that sort of leads me to be here. But it's always been about teams. That's been um, my, my key, I think. And I think to say that for Adroit as well is probably uh, is very accurate. Um, it's really about people um, and it doesn't matter how good your planning is, it doesn't matter uh, how good your, um, your uh, business plan and your, and your business approach is and however many systems and IT revamps that you do, it always comes down to the people that have got to actually apply it on the ground, where the rubber hits the road if you like. Um, and that's where uh, Adroit really seeks to do our work. We work with people and as I say, I think across my career it's really always been about individuals and getting the, the best out of people. So without further ado, let's just um, take a little bit of time uh, for a moment and just read this quote. It's one of my favorite quotes um, and, uh, and I'll pick up once you've had a moment to read that. So what we're trying to say with, uh, with Winnie the Pooh there, and I'm not sure how well uh, he translates, obviously a very British um, uh, uh, book, but, uh, but I'm sure we all know it very well. Uh, I think we all know the feeling, uh, and we all know what Edward Bear means. Um, it's very difficult to take uh, a moment and think about what am I actually seeking to achieve here? What actually are my key outcomes? Um, because it's very difficult to stop bumping our heads. It's very difficult to find that space and that opportunity just to have a think about where am I right now? Why am I here? Where am I trying to get to? And how am I going to bridge that gap? And I think what we're going to talk about a little bit today is a little bit of um, sort of self-awareness maybe about where you are out there and, um, and also a little bit about how we might be able to put a few things in place that make those things easier. 
Now, just a sort of word about the webinar um, particularly. Now, webinars are fairly impersonal. I, I've uh, done, done my fair share of them and, and clearly been part of a number of them as well in, in, in my past. Uh, and they are, as I say, quite impersonal. So what I would say is please do use the, um, the chat uh, window. It would be great to get some questions as I go through. I don't want this to sort of become a bit of a, a, a monologue, which um, I think uh, webinars can do at, at, at times. I will be very much looking forward to sort of um, going down, asking uh, and, and finding a few answers to questions as we go through. So I think that's much more uh, interesting and engaging for everybody. So please do um, uh, get part of the session as well. And there are times when I will be able to pick up on the points I've made. So. What are we actually looking at uh, doing as we uh, as we go through the next hour or so? Well, firstly, we're going to look a little bit about uh, building high performance teams. But but really importantly, I think we need to look at what actually constitutes a high performance team. Uh, we're going to look at why goals, direction, and focus are, are really key. Uh, and we're going to again seek to understand a little bit more about what they actually are. Again, lots of words that get thrown around in the sort of development sphere. What actually are we trying to talk about when we make these uh, when we use this lexicon? Uh, then we're going to look at the sort of the vital link between planning and activity. How do we move plans into action? Um, and one of the first places I'll, uh, I'll take you through today is about communication um, and how effective communication really is the, the, the very first thing that needs to be in place to help people understand what it is they're trying to achieve uh, and moving a plan into something that uh, turns into a, a result. And then we're going to move a little bit into coaching and how coaching as a style of leadership um, can get the very best out of people. We are engaged in a lot of companies around the world who are seeking to engage their uh, employees better, to understand and be able to get past sort of demographic divides or cultural divides um, and try and speak in a, in a, in a way that everybody can, uh, can engage and understand. Uh, and the very best way we found of doing that is a coaching style of leadership. I'm going to take you through sort of the very basics of what coaching constitutes. And then, of course, we're going to come back. We're going to tie that together and we're going to look at what actually happens when you have leaders at all levels and what creates and, and sustains leaders at all levels. So our first place to go really is to understand a little bit about what is a high performing team. Well, I think it's fair to say that a high performing team will always have very clear goals and very um, well articulated outcomes. Um, I have seen high performing teams in so many um, walks of life. I've played in them in sport, I've worked and seen them in business, uh, in the military in particular, and also on humanitarian deployments where uh, a team who've been new to an environment and completely uh, unknown to each other before they've arrived there, arriving from all over the world, have had to solve a very complex and very difficult problem um, in the most trying of circumstances. I've seen really good teams um, achieve those sort of outcomes. Um, so I've coached them, I've been in them, I've led them, and I've watched them from the outside. And I think some of the common factors are the ones you see. The clear goals and outcomes, they communicate really well. People state what they need very clearly, they explain why it is important, and people understand and acknowledge the why behind the outcome, if you like. And they also acknowledge the values and the motivations of team members uh, at the individual level, and they will adjust their message uh, where, it's uh, where it's required. Uh, and we'll come on to a little bit more on that in a moment. Um, and the next thing is, is they manage conflict effectively, um, which by inference means that they have conflicts, and often they do. Um, some of the highest performing teams I've worked with and been around, as an outsider, it looks uh, a very rough and ready environment in which to work. People do challenge each other, but what they do is they challenge in a way that keeps conflict productive. Um, and so what they work with is they work with the outcome being the focus of the discussion. Uh, it's not personalized into the way that an individual is doing it, and it's not uh, taken personally by the individual um, who's being questioned. It's a case of interpreting questions right. And I think when you hear phrasing, uh, for example, somebody challenging by saying, is this the very best way that we can think of uh, to get this goal achieved? I think we find that that uh, really helps teams uh, discuss and coach each other 
through challenges and make sure that they're always being as agile uh, and they're always being as effective as they might be. And that sort of links in, if you like, to the next point, the, 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 they share team values. Um, the values of the team, the culture, if you like, um, are very clearly stated and they are talked about and they are addressed uh, and they're agreed upon. And very importantly, it's, they're called out when necessary and people are challenged by their, their, in their behaviors and their approaches to say, hey, you know, we've had this discussion. Uh, what we do when we're asking these kind of questions or we're attempting to reach these kinds of stretch goals is we don't treat each other like that. We step back, we think much more clearly, and again, we don't personalize uh, the, the method of achieving the goal. Uh, and that calling out, I think, is one of the strongest things in a team that is performing really well. And then finally, and, and most obviously, they get the results they want. Uh, they're successful in achieving their stated goals. Um, and the other thing, of course, is that they learn as they go. And what they do is understand where they are strong, they understand weaknesses, uh, and they try and build upon their strengths as well as constantly addressing their weaknesses. They learn as they go. And I think uh, a constant learning environment is something that we all would seek to have within our teams and organizations. But actually, it becomes really important to know what that looks like when it's being done. And gathering a team together and discussing what's happened and how effective they've been in the achieving of a goal, I think is a very strong start point to that. And it's a very uh, helpful habit that high performing teams have. Uh, I work with um, an organization uh, who sponsor the Eagle Race, which is a round the world yacht race. 74 foot yachts, but all the yachts are identical. Um, some crews go all the way around the world, some crews only do certain legs of it. Um, but the best team that we found that was working within that, um, within that race and the one that was getting the best results was the one that did really simple things. And some of those really simple things were at the end of each watch, which would be four to six hours, depending where they were in the world and what the weather conditions were like, uh, would sit down and go, what went well on that watch and what didn't go so well? What do we want to develop? What do we want to change? How can we work better with each other? What needs to be said now before we go back up top again and get beaten up in 30 foot waves in the Southern Ocean? What do we need to get out of our system so we can understand how we can be as effective as possible? And getting into that kind of habit within a team is really healthy uh, and we find it makes a, a big difference to overall performance. So I think that sort of gives us what we can gather to be a high performing team and some of the habits of those high performing teams. And to pick up that sort of first point on, on clear goals and outcomes, I just want to share with you um, some, uh, some interesting numbers. It's uh, from a Harvard Business Review study, um, and it's a reasonably infamous study. It was a longitudinal study that, that went on for about 15 years. And they took some Harvard, Harvard Business School graduates, and they asked them about goals and goal setting. Um, and I'm sure it would surprise all of us, or, or some of us maybe, um, that 84% of the respondees had no specific goals in life. Goals was just Goals were something that they thought they might like to achieve, but actually weren't specific in what they are or how they might seek to get there. 84% of those people. Now, 13% of them, they had goals, but they didn't write them down. They didn't express them. And actually, quite importantly, they didn't share them. Uh, they just felt that they had a direction with which they would like to be traveling. And then only 3% of that cohort had written goals and a plan of how they were going to achieve it. And importantly, they shared those goals and those plans beyond just their own um, sort of intellectual uh, exercise of understanding them. And as they followed those uh, people through their careers, it was very interesting to see that that 3%, uh, 10 years later, were earning 10 times as much as those who had no specific goals. They found that actually business return on both their their own performance and the business performances they were in was, was 10 times what it was those if they weren't setting goals. So I think a very, um, a very interesting study is to what it actually takes to have a goal and what a goal actually is. Because again, I think we all know what a smart goal might be, uh, but it's about being accountable. It's about it being clear. It's about it being well communicated and it's about the execution of actually achieving it. So let's look a little bit about 
goals, uh, a direction and focus. And I said I'd sort of pick some of those words apart for us in the introduction, and, and I think that's really important to do. So goals, I think we're pretty much there. Uh, we know what needs to be achieved. Uh, they're a smart goal. That's a phrase that's been around a long time. I think we all understand now. But most importantly, we're held accountable to them. Now, I think direction, when we use the phrase goals, direction and focus, the direction part is really about where a trusted team can be given an outcome to achieve. It's simply direction for their efforts, and then they're left to achieve it, and they're left to do it within their own resources. They're trusted to be able to self-organize to the point where a simple piece of direction is clear, it's unambiguous, and they form the way that they're going to, to achieve that. And then, of course, it's a case of focus. Now, focus, I would say, is where the priorities and relative importance of projects and activities are made clear across the team and they're really well understood. Um, it's very difficult, I think, sometimes and very frustrating in the workplace when we see resources and time and effort being pushed away from whatever it is we're trying to achieve uh, and we feel that it's being put elsewhere. Um, I think that understanding of where the focus is right now is really important. And that comes from very clear planning, but it also comes from taking a more holistic view of what it is the organization and the team are trying to achieve. And so when we understand which has to be done now and why, I think the relative importance of where we sit becomes clearer and we're better able to help in, in the most effective way to get the organization and the team moving. So I think the piece that grows out of that is understanding the organizational strategy. Um, but without understanding how those strategic aims of the organizations really impact and affect the activities of the departmental and the team and even the individual outcomes, without understanding that, uh, a strategic plan is simply a C-suite exercise, uh, which is more for maybe an external uh, audience or even the board to look at and say, well, we approve of that. That looks like it's doing everything like, like we would like to see it done. Uh, what it doesn't do is impact inside the organization to genuinely guide their activities and their outcomes. So it's so important that that organizational strategy is turned into operational goals, departmental plans, departmental plans that carry budgets and timelines, uh, plans that allow teams within that department to see when it is that they are going to need to achieve a certain outcome, but also to be able to understand how those outcomes are predicated by other teams achieving, and also how their efforts then fit in um, with the achievements of others and how important it is. And also across an organization, it's great to have uh, annual goals or even uh, quarterly goals, but actually we need to be able to spread the effort and we need to be able to spread the, uh, the priorities and the resources, if you like, across that time span because it's very difficult to have the resources within any organization to do everything all at once. And, uh, and again, being able to break down those operational goals to synchronize how all that comes together is really important. And then, of course, that gives us goals and targets at the individual level. And by understanding the goals and targets of others, we see how they fit in. Now, interestingly, um, also understanding uh, what it is that success actually is. Um, I'll tell a quick story here, actually. I, I work a lot in the oil and gas world, and I was called into a work with a team in the Midland Basin in Texas. Um, uh, and they were a team that consistently outperformed. They were a great team. Um, and it was the acquiring team that got us in because they wanted to know um, a few things about that team. Um, its score sheets, as I mentioned, outperformed hugely. It, 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 was, it was a great result. Actually, what I found is it had extremely low morale when we did an organizational climate survey. and also had very high turnover rates, um, but it did achieve what it needed to. And what we found was it was a team that was extraordinary at celebrating its successes, which is a very important thing to acknowledge is, is, is key, I think, for people's motivation. But what it was easy to do at um, as a, as a as far less productive way of, uh, of behaving was um, picking over the bones of a Um, this for a contract. Um, but that will be And it has to become extremely personal. We found that people 
were very poor and not being uh, where there may be a failure or a or, or a lack of success. And so what we tried to do uh, was help us and what we forensically and why it was that they secured. We look at the ones where they, which was their natural response to failure. We look at the ones where they succeeded, and it took some time. Really good understanding what to win for them. Then we took the um, the failures and we put the failure cases of this one. Uh, we can see how we work through that list and make it work. And we fail much more importantly, having failure to success rather than simply berating ourselves for a failure. We know what we need. We know what this one didn't have. So now we know how we're going to change that for the future. And it was a very powerful way of building that team. Their score stayed very high. But what they also found was that the team stabilized. The team was much more um, coherent in the way it made an approach to a client. And its client management vastly improved. And actually, even for an outperforming team, uh, they lifted it another notch. They were a really good set of salespeople. And we really empowered them to succeed even more, actually. So understanding what it is to win, I think, is really important within a team. Now, moving from planning into action. Um, great planning is, is something that we see more and more in, in good forward-thinking organizations. Um, but how do we take that strategic and operational planning uh, into some well-directed and deliberate action? Well, the first piece to that has got to be good communication uh, and being able to effectively communicate desired outcomes. Uh, and we're going to step into some, some sort of communication models specifically in a moment. But the second needs to be to be able to engage the individual and the collective skills of the team to maximize the performance, the makeup of that team to do its very best. Uh, and we have found no better and definable way of doing this than for a company to deliberately adopt and pursue a coaching approach within its organization. And there are so many reasons for that. I'm, I'm going to get into the, the specifics of that and a few things on how we can actually do that and some really applicable skills uh, that we'll be able to, uh, you'll be able to use this afternoon, if you like, um, from, uh, from understanding a few things about a good coaching approach. But we'll come to that after we have a, a brief look at communication. So clearly, it's the key to moving a team in any direction. Um, they have to know uh, where they're going and why, and communicating that must be very clear and it must be very unambiguous. Now, when we communicate, what we tend to do is we tend to communicate with people uh, in a way that we like to hear things. Uh, everybody has a slightly different style of communicating, um, but what it almost always does is reflect the way in which they like to be communicated with. Um, the sort of very famous Moravian principle that states, you know, 93% of what people like about us when we communicate with them comes from our body language, our tone, and the intonation of our voice. Uh, only 7% comes from the words that we actually use. So. What we can take from that is that it's very much about how we deliver the message, if you like, rather than specifically what the message is. And, and there's a lot to build on with that. We do an awful lot of personal impact and communication work. Um, but of course, the funny thing that we see whenever somebody uh, is told they're going to do a presentation or make a speech or, or be in front of people is they sit down and they start writing words. Um, but as we know, only 7% uh, um, is really about the words. It's much more about the delivery. And what we have to do is nuance the way we act and the way that we speak in order to get our message across most effectively to different audiences. Uh, and what we're looking for is a way in which people see uh, and experience our communication and to be able to change that to gather as many people up um, and, and cover as broad a base as we can of styles and ways of communicating. Uh, and we'll, we're going to look specifically into, into some of that. But what I tend to find with people is when somebody fails to understand what we're trying to say to them, what we most commonly do is simply say it again. Uh, maybe we say it a bit slower, and sometimes we may say it a bit louder, but the same key message is the same. We don't change the way we do this, and, and what you tend to find is it, it fails all over again. 
need to take a different approach and a slightly different strategy to getting the message across would be much more effective. And so we need, need to be able to use language, a certain type of language that, that triggers interest and buy-in from different types of people. The, uh, the one that we use um, most commonly with a joint is something called the Strength Deployment Inventory. Now, it's a communication model. It's also a self-awareness tool to understand what it is that you like and you, how you like to be communicated with. So you can see yourself doing it, if you like. And then once you understand the, the common principles of it, then you can see how other people are using it and other, people, other ways that people interact with each other. It's a very simple and effective model. Uh, and, and crucially, it helps teams find a way to be productive despite conflict because it acknowledges that conflict will often be part of our communication because, of course, people like to hear things in different ways. So in very simple terms, the SDI model states that people find motivation really from four different uh, areas in their lives. The first is in performance and task achievement. People like to get things done. Uh, and for some people, this is a greater or lesser driver in their motivations, that sort of outcome and achievement side. The other areas are people and relatedness. Uh, and what you'll find when, with people and relatedness is that for them, it's much more about the emotional attachment. It's much more about the uh, relationship with people. And you see people who uh, are really much more about that relatedness in the way that they communicate. They're at a very personal very individual, uh, very careful level to maintain the best possible uh, relationship with people. Other people are, are more uh, driven by process analysis. They like to know how it is, why something happens. Um, and they like to have the comfort of knowing that if I do this, this will be the outcome. And they, they, they get a lot of value in the analysis they do to be able to understand that process. And then finally, you see an area which is a function of all three, really, which we see in the center of the, uh, the triangle. And that's what we call the hub. And the people in the hub are really about a collaborative approach, uh, about a team approach, about being part of a group. Um, and what we tend to find is most people will cluster around the central hub, but will be more driven by people performance or process to greater or lesser extents. So everybody has a drive to a certain degree within those areas but actually it will differ between people as to which ones are more or less dominant. Now we see this a lot when we go and work with commission-based sales, for example. Um, uh, good salespeople are very good at reading the client, actually, uh, and reading a potential customer. They know what they should be talking about. Uh, a customer that's very interested in performance, for example, will be driving you hard on price, uh, and they will see it as a competition to get the price down as far as they possibly can. They're very performance-driven. Then you'll have a client who's all about case studies, who's all about facts and figures and detail. Um, and this is one of the key factors that, that we find as they try and work that detail. Um, they want to get all the facts from you before they make a decision. So you need to give them facts, you need to feed them facts. And then you get the people-based um, uh, clients, and they're the ones that, that really they want to talk any, about anything other than the sale of money. They want to talk about families, they want to go out for a meal, and at the end they have a sort of awkward conversation of a couple of minutes in which you agree to, they agree to buy something. Um, and so being able to nuance your message around those areas is very powerful in sales. Uh, but what you can also see, of course, is that not everybody tends to fall specifically into one area and reflect that behavior all the time. So those that are in the overlap areas, it won't surprise you to know, um, in, the, in the top overlap area, they are about people, but they're about performance, and they're about helping people achieve an outcome, if you like. Uh, process and performance, well, that's about doing the analysis and deciding what needs to happen and being very driven and achieving it. And then finally, um, the people uh, and the process piece, uh, which is really about understanding to help people, if you like, um, and, and being able to to give people really simple and effective methods to achieve an outcome and helping people understand that. So when you see people in those different areas, how do you need to couch your message? How do you need to couch your communication so that they can, uh, they can uh, understand it most effectively? Well, this slide, I'll, I'll give you uh, a few minutes to sort of uh, glance through it, but I'll add a little bit to it uh, uh, as we do that. The first being uh, the blue area. Now, the blue area is all about people. 
Um, and they're about people who value relationships. Um, and blue would be the color that we attribute to them within the strength deployment in inventory. Now you can see that it's about emphasizing relationships, about good honest communication. It's about showing concern for how things affect people. It's that very sort of people focused uh, uh, view of the world. Now, the next one would be task achievement, which is red. Um, and dealing with somebody who's all about task achievement uh, in the red area, you've got to be positive, clear, you've got to be direct and brief. Start with the outcome, uh, start with what they're going to get, and then work backwards. Um, and also emphasize the challenges that need to be overcome. People in the red enjoy a challenge and have very clear time frames. Tie it down to outcome, 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 and achievement. People in the green, people in the green, as I've said, are all about factual uh, logic, all about um, unemotional um, facts and figures, and you have to be able to step into that and make a clear, logical, and sequential message. So if you were, for example, uh, somebody who's leading a team who's very red and it's all about here's what we're going to do and then we're going to do this and then that'll happen and that's how we're going to win. People in the green are not going to come with you because they want to know why it is that you think that's the case. And so you need to be able to give them enough detail and enough context to bring them along with you. And then finally, the hub. People in the hub are very collaborative. They ask for opinion uh, and they look for options. They like options. And they like to hear dialogue and collaboration. Uh, and they like to see things from different people's perspective. And so the hub really is where we see many people, um, but they will always generally be nuanced by being a bit more towards the green, a bit more towards the red, or a bit more towards the blue, even though they, they sit in the hub. Uh, and the other thing about people in the hub, actually, which is always interesting, is, is if you have a team that is lacking anybody in the other three areas, what they will very often do is adopt those behaviors, if you like, to complete the group. Um, so those are the sort of the key things that you see from the hub, uh, very much more as a collaborative group. Uh, so being able to nuance your message across those four areas becomes really important um, because you will have individuals in your team who, even from that brief description, you'll be able to see how uh, their individual communication styles and their individual motivations uh, need to be acknowledged in order to get an effective message across. Uh, particularly difficult to do when you're in meetings or in group environments, but maybe by nuancing your, um, your message by talking about outcomes but giving some of the uh, analysis that's led to that, by engaging people at the personal level and acknowledging people at the personal level within, within the group, but then also drawing them together, together as a collective outcome uh, and being able to spread your message across those areas, it means you'll be, uh, you'll be listened to uh, much more effectively. So that's the SDI, if you like. There's, there's something we haven't got a time really to get into here, and this is, this is about how people's behaviors change when they enter conflict. Um, if somebody's naturally preferred behaviors from wherever they happen to be in the triangle aren't being productive, they aren't getting the, the self-worth that they would wish from any of those areas, what they will tend to do is then adopt another style of behaving in the hope that that's going to get their message across uh, in the way that, that they would like it to. Uh, and although we don't have time really to delve into that, what we tend to find is, is there is a predictable set of behaviors that people move to. So even if you start with your sort of feelings more broadly in the hub, um, if that's not working, you can't get your message across, then as you start to enter conflict, you'll be uh, tempted to use one of the other behavior styles. So you might suddenly become very factual. And actually, you, you look quite cold. Um, if your people skills aren't working, then you, you go to facts, you go to logic, and it looks like you've kind of changed for people. But what it means is it means that you don't feel that your behavior in blue is being valued, so you'll try something else. And what happens then is you move further through a conflict um, process, you get less and less able to hear other people's uh, opinions, you get less and less able to concentrate on the problem at hand, and then you get less and less able to think about anything than what you need from this situation. Uh, and that means that your, uh, concomitantly your communication, uh, the effectiveness of it falls off and it falls off and it falls off. And in the end, you end up feeling very bad about it, uh, and other people haven't enjoyed the experience either. 
So being able to understand when you're going into conflict, when you're seeing conflict in other people, that's a way then to be able to step back and change the way that you're sending your messages in order to, uh, to keep people on board, if you like, and, and keep things productive. So I think that's probably uh, uh, enough on those communication styles and, 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 a, and an introduction to some of the conflict stuff. Um, but what we find is, is teams that are really good teams, they understand their messaging, they understand the people that they in, interact with, and they also know enough about conflict to bring people back from wherever they happen to be in conflict and speak to me in a way that, that they can now hear you, if you like. So the other way of, uh, of sort of building upon that uh, and using those um, communication skills in a, in a very clear and simple way uh, would be in coaching. And coaching is something that, that has been around you know, a good long while, and, and I think uh, you know, coaching was a bit of a, a wild west uh, for a while. You know, it was all about coaches and coaching and on being coached and this kind of stuff. Uh, and I think now coaching is really finding its, its uh, definitions and it's finding its feet, if you like, as a really strong business process. But, um, but we tend to see it moving beyond that sort of one-to-one, -one, I've got a coach kind of approach, and actually having uh, coaching all the way through an organization as a way of people behaving and interacting, leading and interacting uh, with each other. So to define coaching, I think is really, uh, really important. And these are uh, Whitmore's and, and, and Downey's um, uh, definitions, which I think capture it most effectively. Um, one would be unlocking a person's potential to maximize their own performance. Uh, and that uh, comes from a sporting background, actually, Whitmore. But Downey was more of a business uh, focus in his work, and he's about the art of facilitating the performance, learning, and development of another. And all of those things, I think, uh, are very uh, laudable within an organization. They're something that people uh, would value, I'm sure, but it's being able to turn that into a business outcome and turn that into somebody's motivation and engagement, if you like. So a quick run through the sort of nuts and bolts of coaching, if you like. Um, we use a, a very simple uh, coaching model. What we don't like to do is um, spend a very great deal of time at the, uh, at the sort of uh, high intellectual theoretical level. What we like to be able to do is get into an organization and get them practically applying uh, all of that research and insight we're about is the practical application. And this is one of the best models, really practical application of coaching. I the work of, of John Neal. Uh, and he calls these the, uh, the six world-class basics of coaching. Um, but we'll start off in the middle because um, the, the area that, that uh, so much of all of this is, uh, is couched upon is self-awareness. Uh, and that comes from within the coach themselves. They have to understand the sort of person they are, if you like. Uh, and they need to know what they're bringing into coaching and the coaching of people when they, when they do that work. So um, once you have that, and, and, and the SDI is a great way of understanding how it is you see the world, uh, you can coach much more effectively. Uh, and we've already gone through goals. Setting goals is the most important thing. But what a goal gives a coach and a coachee is something to aim at. Uh, and spending some time analyzing a goal is really important. Uh, then we need to understand about feedback. And feedback comes from two areas. It comes from within yourself and it comes from others. And once you get that feedback and you're getting that consistently put back to assess where you are in your performance against a goal rather than, again, taking it personally, that's a very effective way to be able to uh, make change and, and, and move things on if you like. Uh, adaptability. Adaptability comes really uh, primarily um, from the coach themselves. They have to be able to park their own thoughts, their own views on things, uh, and be able to draw more and more from the coachee um, to allow them to be able to explore some of their ideas and their way of doing things. Uh, and so that adaptability comes not only in the way that the, that the coach works, but also, if you like, in making the, the, the coachee, the person that's being coached, more broad and adaptable in their thinking. I think one of the real keys to it all is good questions. Um, and everyone always says, oh, well, when you're coaching, you can only use open questions. That's not actually the case. Um, using the right question at the right time, 
Open questions are great for looking at context and looking more broadly across a, a situation, but to bring self-awareness to the coachee, sometimes the coach has to close down the questioning to get to a point of understanding for the coachee. And sometimes when I'm doing it, it comes right down to a, so is it this or is it that? Which is it? Uh, and when they are forced to choose, Again, it adds to that self-awareness, it adds to their, their, their own understanding of the situation. So it's not always about open questions. It's about asking the right question at the right time. Listening is also a, a, a vital skill. Um, and I think it's something that we very, very rarely see people uh, trained and developed in, in the ability to listen. Um, uh, COVID did some great work on types of listening, you know, attentive listening or, or um, listening but not really listening and, and, and a whole range of sort of thoughts on, on, on good and bad styles of listening. But being actually able to empathise and listen uh, and first seek to understand before you then engage with, the, uh, with what's being said is something that uh, we don't see developed in people very often, but people who do it well are a very long way ahead of those who don't do it well. I would certainly say that's a, a, a fair point. And then finally, the trust and rapport. And trust and rapport is something that really only comes with time, but, but a good coaching relationship will discuss feelings and ideas very easily. Um, and some of those things are difficult to share in some respects um, until you trust somebody, until you have a rapport with them. And so it takes a little while for coaching to really take root uh, as a result of that, but when a coachee is genuinely trusted by a coach and vice versa, then what you have is a very quick and effective way of moving through a goal uh, and understanding where that goal sits, how we can solve that and what we're going to do next. Which leads us very neatly actually into um, where somebody is as they're being coached. A good coach understands the coaching continuum. Um, if you are in a more mental role within an organization uh, and you seek to coach somebody, simply asking them questions about something isn't going to help them know something they don't know. So uh, the work of David Clutterbuck does a great insight into what he calls the coaching continuum. For some coaches, there is the absolute need to tell them and show them first. This is where the practical application of coaching comes in, which is what we would always advocate. So if somebody doesn't actually know something because they've never done it or they've never seen it before, then there is an element of show and tell. But that must stop once they start to build their skills and experience. And as a coach, you need to be able to move the coachee on to uh, maybe doing a little bit in the mentoring role, which would be more of a suggest, but eventually to be able to step back, give them what they need to get the work done. And all you're doing then is stimulating their thinking, their view and their plan on how they're going to achieve a goal. And so the coaching continuum is different for every single person you coach. Where are they right now? How do I need to approach this if I'm more in the role of coach mentor, for example? Uh, I think it's a great model to think about rather than this sort of nefarious thing that says, well, I'm coaching you now. Yeah, but I just need to know stuff. Well, let's have a look at that. Well, yeah, there are some things they just need a result on first, then move into the coaching continuum. And what you'll find is that that coaching continuum isn't necessarily done uh, over a long period of time. You can be moving along the coaching continuum within the same coaching conversation. Um, and, uh, and that helps people explore their thinking and come up with their own plans and ideas. Now, here's the most um, applicable piece, I think, of, uh, of the piece I'm talking to you about with coaching. And that is the GROW model. Grow model is something we use very often um, to really get people's um, practical coaching going. It's a conversation structure. Uh, and once uh, you start coaching an individual and you understand the grow model, uh, as the coach and the coachee, it adds a really useful handrail. And I would say the GROW model is applicable in so many areas. Uh, a good meeting will work along the GROW model very often, um, as well as a good coaching conversation. So the, go, the GROW model is, as you can see from the slide, made up of uh, goal, reality, options, and will. So goal, what do you want, what do you need to do? And examining that goal to say, 
what are the outcomes, when do we need it done by, who do we have in our skill set to be able to do that, what skills do you have to be able to do that, to be able to really examine the goal to make sure that you understand what it actually is you're trying to achieve. And then you step into the R, you step into reality. And reality is where are you now, really? What's the context within which we're trying to achieve the goal? What have we got that's going to help us do that? What have we got that's going to be a challenge to achieving the goal? So where are the things that we can uh, look at within the, within the context and the situation we're in at the moment, the environment, if you like, how does that goal match with the current situation? And then you get into options. So what can we do to get past current reality or um, use the, uh, the skills that we have in our current reality in order to achieve the goal. Now, people who use this model badly, in your linear model, uh, where you would go, uh, then goal reality options, well, you don't. You spend a great deal of time between reality and options, cyclically discussing, here's an option, well, let's take that option and let's put that against our current reality, and let's help that understand a little bit more about how we can make that work. So what you then do is, is you start to develop a plan forward uh, until you come up with something that matches the goal in your current reality, you have the option, you have a plan if you like. Now, lots of organizations are good, I would say, at one, two, and three, goals, reality, and options. But I would also challenge you to say, how many times do you have a really good meeting uh, you've come up with a really good plan, you've examined uh, how, how you're going to get there, you've looked at what the, what the uh, impacts of it is and, and, and the context within in which it needs to be achieved. Everyone feels great, they get up, they leave the room, and quick as a flash, nothing happens. And that is because you never got to the will. The will ties completely into the accountability that you see in the first thing you set up within the goal. So if I am doing a coaching conversation, they tend to last about an hour or so, I will always spend the last 15 minutes, 25% of the time, on the will. What will you do now? What is going to happen? Who's going to do it? When's it going to be done by? What do you need to get that achieved? All of those factors, the will needs to be examined in real detail. Because then what you have is a very motivating conversation because you now know what it is you're trying to achieve. You can see how it fits into everything else you've got to get done. You've got a plan to take it forward, and now I've got a step-by-step -step that I'm going to undertake to get that done. And here's the key if you're coaching somebody through the will. I put the notebook down. I take nothing um, from the will. Uh, I make them write it in the notebook. I make them record. Outlook. I make them, if you like, own the plan. And what I would suggest is when you're in a meeting and you say, okay, well, that's great, that's all agreed, excellent, I'll send you an email. If you write the synopsis uh, and you send the email, it's your plan. And if it works, if it doesn't work, well, it's your plan. So giving them the will, giving them the plan and giving them the execution, what you then say is, Excellent. Could you just summarize that on an email for me so I know when things have got to be done by and who's going to be doing them? Give them the will back. It's a really powerful way of getting people motivated and engaged in, in, in achieving an outcome. So, as I said, the GROW model, I think, is applicable in, in all sorts of places as a, as a conversation structure. First degree, what it is you're, you're talking about, we're trying to achieve. Where are we now? How can we get to that goal? Right, what's going to happen next? A very powerful um, way of structuring your thinking. It's not the only coaching model, but it's the one we tend to uh, find most applicable and most usable. Good. So all of this kind of builds into a culture and a way of doing things. Uh, and, and I think this is a real truism, this, this slide. Um, if an organization does not seek to create and proactively manage a desired culture, it will end up with the culture it gets rather than the one it wants. And I spend a huge amount of time in organizations uh, where they're using the phrase culture change. Uh, and it's because that positive culture has not been positively managed, rewarded, and most importantly, held accountable and called out when it's not, uh, when it's not uh, seen. It has, to be, it has to be really easily lived 
uh, if you like, in order to get a really good culture. And you have to have those conversations that say, how do we do things around here? And when somebody doesn't behave in that way, say, that's not really how we do things around here, is it? And then you have the conversation that, that follows that. But you have to manage it, and you have to do it very positively. You can't just let it drift, as I say, or you'll get the one you get rather than the, the one you want. So I'm just going to um, tell a very quick um, story about a deployment I did to Afghanistan, it was my last deployment to Afghanistan, actually. Uh, and how I took a team um, and managed to set up a team that was uh, very good uh, at leading at all levels. Um, we knew we were off to Afghanistan probably uh, six months longer than that, actually, nine months before the deployment. Um, and we spent the six months leading up uh, to the deployment before the real uh, scheduled deployment training started, thinking about how it was we were going to approach that, um, that, that deployment. Uh, and what we did is we asked everybody, everybody out of the 140 odd people in the company who'd been to Afghanistan before, it didn't matter how old they were, what rank they were, where they were in the organization, they had to stand up and talk for 10 minutes about their last experiences or the experiences they've had in Afghanistan up to that point. And we started to get, take themes from, from those discussions. Uh, and it's quite a lot to ask a 19 year old guy to stand up in front of 130 of his friends and the boss and the boss's boss um, and talk about what they experienced. But actually you'll be surprised how, uh, how, much, uh, how much gold there is in there when you ask the questions really at, at the coal face, if you like. And we started to get a load of themes that came out. And, uh, and one of those themes was, was um, it's not a military problem. It doesn't matter how much um, we throw at this militarily, uh, we're not going to win because that's not the battle we're fighting. And we realized very quickly we were fighting a battle of ideas, um, not a battle of, uh, of, of guns and bullets. Um, however, once you've got a military and you've trained them to be very good with guns and bullets, that tends to be what they like to reinforce. And I knew from my past experience that all of the pre-deployment specific training was going to be about was actually was going to be about shooting and really effectively and bringing in uh, aircraft and artillery but i knew that that wasn't going to get us further along to our operational outcomes our operational outcomes were about stability well there's no community or environment that's stable when people are shooting at each other in it so my aim was to do as little of that as possible um, and do much more of the community uh, level work that was really going to get the right results um, then rather surprisingly, uh, a short while before we deployed, um, we deployed in September, but between the Christmas and the March of that year, uh, I was in Norway, um, which wasn't hugely applicable to the work we were going to do in Norway. Uh, and so we had to think very creatively about why we were there, what we could get out of that that was actually going to serve our key outcome. And our key outcome, obviously, was the deployment to Afghanistan. So that was where I decided to get the whole shooting thing out of the way. Uh, and we, everything we did in, in that Norway for my company was about shooting well um, because I knew we were going to be asked to do that, but I wanted to be able to get past all that as quickly as possible and onto the more, uh, uh, let's say, intellectual side uh, and community-based side of what we were doing. So averagely, I think uh, an infantry uh, marine uh, in the UK forces will tend to fire about 5,000 rounds a year. Um, uh, on that three-month Norway deployment, everybody in my company fired at least 12,000 rounds a man. Um, so we knew that everybody there could hit a bottle top three times running at 200 meters from a standing position. That was what we needed to get right uh, in order to tick the box, if you like, of the more um, conventional training that we were going to do prior to going to Afghanistan. So that meant we could really use the skills we had from that as a, just a backdrop to using the scenarios and the, uh, and the understanding we had much more broadly of the problem when we got into the training. And that last photo you can see on the, uh, on the top right there, that's my, uh, that's my policeman, actually that's my military policeman, because what we're trying to bring to that area of Afghanistan was law and order. Uh, and he therefore was the most important man in the company because he understood what it is to deliver law in a lawless place. And so his knowledge was about how we structured the community approach, about how we bought stability, if you like, because that's what underpins it. And so although he doesn't look um, like he's uh, right at the front of everything we did, it was his knowledge that drove what we did. His, was, his were the skills that, that we needed. And the thing that got in the way of all that, of course, was the uh, improvised explosive device, of which I have some, uh, some personal experience. Um, 
but what we had was very little knowledge and understanding of that. Um, and we knew it was a key problem for us to not understand what we needed to about that particular problem. So we were very um, frustrated by this, and we worked really hard to try and figure out a way where we could understand more about this because information was very limited on it. People weren't really talking about it. It was just something that we knew was going to be an issue, but, but there was no official line of finding out anything about it. Um, and so one of, my, uh, one of my corporals, a couple of ranks below me, uh, one day came up with a brilliant idea, uh, and it was from him that, the whole thing grew really. He said, well, if we need to understand them, the best way to understand them is we need to make some, don't we? Um, and so we, uh, we had some very interesting times where we made our own improvised devices. Um, and then we understood what it took to hide them. And then we understood what it took to find them. And finding them is the important thing. And by understanding what it took to create them, what it took to try and get them disguised, it, then we understood the challenges that that created, which meant we had a much better idea of how it was we were going to find them. Uh, and by the end of that tour, uh, the area in which we were working, uh, we were finding one of those devices about one every 22 hours. Uh, and we would not find the one that exploded on us on average about every 90 hours. Um, the numbers of those devices in the areas we were working were huge, but they were simply a distraction. And by having the right culture and the right understanding of what it was we were trying to achieve, they remained really as a distraction. They weren't the thing that defined what we were trying to achieve. They were just something that was getting in the way. And keeping that mindset was really important. Yeah, there's a lot of them. Yeah, but we need to make them as irrelevant as possible which is quite a challenge when you're seeing that many of them, but that was the mindset we had to produce. And I think that was really the key to our success on that particular uh, deployment. So what we had within that team really were leaders at all levels. And when you have leaders at all levels, you have an individual understanding of what you're trying to achieve. And that came really from those first few months where we really were just discussing what it is that we needed to be able to do. And then, the individual, when the under, individual understands the outcomes and where they're trying to get to, then the team does too, because of course they're talking about it and they're comparing it and they're discussing it as they go through. And then you get organizational level leadership, which can feed information at the team and the, and the individual level, and they can then enact it. And understanding that and being able to enact uh, the, the outcomes and desires at an individual team and organizational level, well, that genuinely gives you leaders at all levels. And what that gave me on that tour and what that gives teams when I work with them now is it gives each level some space to genuinely lead. They're not making decisions two, three, four layers down in the organization because those decisions are being made at the most appropriate level because they're being made with full understanding of the context in which they're being made. And that makes the organization so much more efficient and effective. Because when there is uncertainty, when people are unclear about what it is they're trying to achieve, they will suck the leadership from you. And you have no space to lead. And it's very difficult to find a gap in all of that noise and stop bumping your head like Edward Bear coming down the stairs. And it's because things aren't being done at the right levels within the organization very often. And so, that's why leaders at all levels become, I think, so vital. So we're sort of drawing towards the, uh, the back end. I think the message that I'm really trying to, to say is it's very possible to take high-performing teams. But a truly high-performing team, what you're trying to create is the team for a challenge. And it doesn't really matter what you throw at them, they're going to get the result you want. What you need to avoid is thinking that you know what the problem is. Because then what you're doing is you're creating a team for the challenge. And I think one thing I learned through all my years of doing uh, all the things I've done is very often what I thought the problem was wasn't actually the problem. What you need to do is arm people to have uh, an understanding of the outcomes they're trying to achieve, the skills they have to do it, and then it doesn't matter what challenge you throw at them. You will have the team for any challenge. And that is genuinely a high-performing team. And it doesn't matter where those teams are. 
Uh, we take people outside and discuss stuff. We do it within classrooms. It doesn't matter where you have those discussions and where you understand that stuff. Uh, you will get high performing teams wherever you seek to build them if you put in these, uh, these fairly basic uh, thoughts that we've gone through for the last hour or so. So um, there's no questions on the, on the board. I think, uh, I think Krista's keen to, uh, to step in. But um, I, I'm very happy to take any questions uh, uh, as they pop up on the, uh, on the chat. But I think we're probably about there. Thanks so much, everyone, for tuning in today. Um, what a great presentation. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Ross, uh, for this information. I think you've given us a lot of food for thought, and we, we really appreciate it. Um, to show you our appreciation for your time and expertise, we're actually making a donation in your name to our scholarship fund. Um, so once again, I'd like to thank and acknowledge University of Fredericton for sponsoring our Lunch and Learn webinar series. I'd like to thank those of you who signed in and uh, got some great information shared with you today. And again, thanks to you, Ross. Really appreciate it.